Hello, Pembina Valley Baptist Church. This is Rick Flanders. Do you remember me? I'm one of the guys from south of the border that comes and visited the, visits the church once in a while. And I have been with you in church, <clears throat> also at the men's retreat out there, fishing for those great big fish, and I always had a great time with Pastor Sullivan, and also a thrill and a blessing every time to see what God is doing at your magnificent church. Well, I'm glad to be a part of what's happening right now, and I'm going to be preaching a sermon on the launching pad. I'm calling it the launching pad. So I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to the Acts of the Apostles. That's the big book after the book of John. Turn to the Acts of the Apostles and find chapter 13. I've got a little bit of something in my throat here that I hope I can clear out so I don't sound too irritating while we speak of the launching pad. Now, there is a launching pad to the Great Commission. When the Lord Jesus Christ gave the Great Commission to his followers, he was serious. He said the gospel must go to every creature, all nations. He said to the uttermost part of the earth. Now, did he mean those words? Or was he exaggerating to interest people or excite people at missions conferences? No, he meant it. The Lord Jesus Christ wants the gospel of his salvation to get to every creature in the world. That's his plan. And, uh, and it can be done. But the launching pad, you've got to know where the launching pad is for the Great Commission. And God lets us know what it is. And it has a lot to do with you and me. Now let's read the verses in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Notice who these are, are that are mentioned to us. Now they are gifted people in the church who minister to others. They are prophets and teachers. There's Barnabas that we know from other things in the book of Acts. And uh, they were in the mid middle of the project to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. And then now something very unusual and significant happened here at the church at Antioch. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now, you've heard of Cyprus, haven't you? That's a large island in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, uh, this church at Antioch is in Syria. Uh, the reason we have a Bible map or Bible maps at the back of our Bible is that what God has revealed to the world has to do with things that he has done in the world. It's history. And it involves people and dates and also locations. So now these two, Barnabas and Saul, sail away to, uh, um, to Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. And the Bible says they were sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Now our story here has to do with, quote, the church. See that in verse one? The word church means congregation. Now what is a congregation? One thing every congregation does is it congregates. Okay, that's a group of people who get together. Sometimes when I preach on the church, I will have someone after the service say, do you mean the local church? And my reply is, well, as far as I'm concerned, what I understand in the Bible is that the church is local. See, we congregate. And you know what? We can see each other because we're in the same room. It's local and uh, it's visible, the local visible church. That is the church of Jesus Christ. 
And you know what? It is a very important thing. Did you know that? The Bible teaches that the church is the body of Christ. That's not talking about all the Christians in the world. That's talking about a congregation of believers who have come together to fulfill the Great Commission. So they are the body of Christ. We are taught in the book of Ephesians. They are the building of Christ. His temple now is not a building made of stone. It is a, uh, a congregation of people. And then they are the bride of Christ. And God's work is being done in the world mainly through the church. It's the center of God's work on earth. Now, what is God's work on the earth? In the book of Acts, which is the book that gives to us the account of what the Christians did after Jesus went to heaven. Chapter 1 and verse 8, just before going to heaven, Jesus said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So here the Lord Jesus Christ said to the apostles that they were to be witnesses unto him to the uttermost part of the earth. But an interesting word in Acts 1.8 is the word both. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and to the uttermost part of the earth. Now I've got a question for you. How can we be in two places at once? Here it says that the people of God are to be witnesses unto him, both here and there, to the uttermost part of the earth. Well, you know how that's done? It's done by the church, which is the launching pad of the Great Commission. It really is. And you know what? Everybody in the world is someone that God loves. And Jesus gave his life on the cross for every last person in the world, in Mongolia, South America, Europe, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. And his plan was for every one of them to be saved, or every one of them to have a chance to be saved. And the launching pad for getting the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person in the world is the church. It really is the church. And we're going to see that because... We are at a church right now, the Pembina Valley Baptist Church. Pray with me, will you? Now, Lord, I'm a long ways away from these dear people who are involved in your church, which is your institution, and it's the launching pad for the Great Commission. You're serious about getting the news of your love to every person in the world. And yet, Lord, that all begins right where we are today. Lord, let the truth of these scriptures be clear to the minds of those who hear this sermon. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, it's, the emphasis is missions. The word mission means comes from a Latin word that means send. Okay? It means send. Now, how is it that our church, Pembina Valley Baptist Church, is the launching pad for the Great Commission. Do you remember Romans 10, 13, where the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Except they be sent. Now, when you got saved, you called upon the name of the Lord, but it wasn't an isolated incident. A number of things happened before you could get saved. Okay, what were they? Okay, right. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Okay, you know how you got saved? Some Christian in a church was sent, was sent somewhere to take the gospel where it had never been before. And this preacher being sent to that place proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ and people heard. Okay, then uh, when they heard, many of them believed and having put their faith in the Savior, they called upon him. 
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So your salvation began with somebody somewhere who sent a missionary in some way or another, either by supporting them financially and officially sending them to a foreign country, or the sending might just be a youth group where uh, a young person in soul winning activity was sent out by the leaders to take the gospel down a certain street. But that's where it began. It is actually a process. Call, believe, hear, preacher, send. Or the other way, sent, preach, heard, believed, call. And the launching pad of it all is the church. We shall be witnesses both here and there. That's right. And uh, that's the plan. And it involves the local church because the local church is the launching pad. That's how that gets going. Things happening at Pemina Valley Baptist Church this week have to do with getting the gospel to every person in the world. Pretty thrilling, isn't it? Okay, these are simple truths, but we're going to review them now, okay? Can we do that? Number one, the church must be functioning. Now, there are churches that are churches in name only. They are called a church because they're affiliated with a denomination. Or the building they're in is called a church. But the church is actually the congregation. And you know what? The congregation, the body of Christ, isn't accomplishing his plan unless it's functioning. Okay, look at verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch, that's in Syria, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simeon, that is called Niger, Lucius of, Life, of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and, and Saul. Okay, now the church there was functioning. You will find them functioning in ministry according to their gifts. In Romans chapter 12, the Bible says that God has given his children gifts. And that is supernatural ability to minister to other people. Among the gifts are prophecy and teaching. Go back to Romans 12 and see what is said. And here in Acts 13, 1 and the following verses, we find a church that is functioning like a body. And the members of the church are, have gifts. And they're ministering to each other according to their gifts. And listen, friends, uh, the church has got to be a, not a church in name only, but a functioning church where the members of the church are ministering to each other according to their gifts. I remember a certain time at the country church where I pastored for 34 years, Judy at a Baptist church. We had a couple of men who had uh, come up uh, through their own church, Fostoria Baptist, and had actually graduated from the Christian school. We sponsored Judy at a Christian school. And uh, two of them in a row came to our Sunday evening service because they were going to go to the mission field. Well, I remember one got up and he started talking about people. People at their rural church, Fall Story of Baptist Church. He started talking about Sunday school teachers. Oh, my life was so affected by Mr. So-and-so, my teenage Sunday school teacher. Youth directors, see, and uh, bus captains, and uh, uh, pastors at their church. And in our church, our assistant pastor who was the principal of our Christian school, teachers at the Christian school, coaches. He's, they, he started listing people who had such a great effect in his life for him to be what he is today. today. That's what we heard him say. Now that was a blessing. We were all crying and happy. <clears throat> the next Sunday, we had another young man who uh, was going to the mission field. He also was from Faustoria Baptist Church. And he got up, and you know what he started doing? He started saying, I thank God for my parents. I am so grateful today for the people who taught me at the Junietta Christian School. I am so thankful for my Sunday school teachers, my youth directors, and the others in the list. 
And that was so interesting to me. We were talking about missions and meeting a missionary, and he was talking about members of the, his church and our church and the way they ministered according to their gifts to him as he grew up. And they didn't know it, but they were having a big part in the Great Commission. They were training a missionary. They never knew he was a missionary in the sixth grade or as he a teenager, but that's what they were doing. And you know what? A functioning church is the launching pad of the Great Commission. Yes. Second thing, it must be partnering with God. Now, I'm sure you noticed this. They were ministering to the Lord, and they were fasting while they ministered and praying. And the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherewith I, uh, I have called them. Uh, whereto I have called them. Whereunto I have called them. And it was the Holy Ghost that they were partnered with. Now, the book of Acts has a lot to say about the Holy Ghost. Because the Christian life and the Christian mission is always functioned, uh, always functions in cooperation and partnership with the Holy Ghost, who is the third person of the Holy Trinity. And so they were partnering with God. We meet them in a prayer meeting. In the prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit is so real that it was as if they could hear him talk. The Holy Ghost said unto them, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work where, whereunto I have called them. If you go back to the book of Romans, chapter 1, you will see that years later, the Apostle Paul declared that he was separated unto the gospel. That's the word that was used by the Holy Ghost in the prayer meeting here at Antioch. And notice, not only the two men who were called to be missionaries, but also everybody in the prayer meeting it was as if they could hear the voice of the Spirit. If you read the book of Acts, you will repeatedly see verses that say, and the Spirit said. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to us in an out loud voice, but his voice is uh, very well understood by spiritual Christians. In the book of Romans, the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And friends, every Christian has the Holy Spirit living inside, and he is leading us. He is leading us. God never intended you as a Christian to be outside of his will. He never intended you to be blind to what his plan was for your life. He's inside you. He's inside all the other members of the church. And if you gather for a prayer meeting, sometimes we all hear his voice. I don't want to be spooky about this. But I've been in many prayer meetings where we all seem to realize God was telling us something. Yes, very, very important. And so they were ministering to the Lord. Now, I know they had a ministry. They were teaching and exhorting. But primarily, they were ministering to the Lord himself. And this intimacy with the Lord through the Holy Ghost is essential to the church being the launching pad of the Great Commission. And you know what? We need to be partnering with God. We are laborers together with God, and that's the kind of church we need to have. And I know that there are prayer meetings at the Pemina Valley Baptist Church, and you know what? Uh, that makes all the difference in the effectiveness of God's church here. Now, a third thing, we all have a part. See, uh, missions is not about Bible colleges or pastors it's about the church. And every one of us ought to be a member of the church. And those who are members, we all have a part in this, as we can see. Matter of fact, something we just went through a minute ago, we all have a part in it. We got saved. You know, when you got saved, then uh, God intended for you to become a witness. And God uses your witness not only to bring the gospel to your local community or your family, but ultimately to the uttermost part of the earth. See, we all have a part. Our salvation, our witness. Let me ask you, are you saved? By that I mean, when you die, is it going to be heaven or the other place? Well, Jesus Christ never intended anyone to go to hell. He came into the world to save the world, that the world through him might be saved. He came to save you. And if you'll let him do it, 
He'll give you a new life and save your soul today. And that would be certainly the, your part in God's big plan for the world. And it's not just your salvation and your witness, but also your obedience. This prayer meeting was made up of men who were yielded to God. And you know, a lot of this stuff is strange. But one thing that's not strange is getting a group of people together who are yielded to God and willing to do whatever he wants done. And when God found them together, ministering to the Lord, willing to do whatever he would have them do, God was able to inform them about his will for Barnabas and Saul. And the church became a, uh, became a launching pad. Okay, now the fourth thing I want to tell you is simply this. Talking about the church being the launching pad of the Great Commission. We can do something now. We all can do something now. We all have a part. And just thinking over what we have read and thought about here, be yielded to the Lord. Now here you are in church, and I'm glad you're here in church, for a guy from south of the border to talk to you uh, by mechanical means. And I'm proud of you and appreciate you. But I'm going to tell you, being in church doesn't mean you're yielded to the Lord. What was the last time you told the Lord that you would be whatever he wanted you to be and do whatever he wanted you to do? You know, in John chapter 15, Jesus Christ says to his followers, you are my friends. And he says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. What was the last time you used the word whatsoever to Jesus Christ? Now, I've got a situation that's kind of puzzling. But I want you to know, Lord, I'll do whatsoever you want me to do. If you let me know what you want done, I will do it whatsoever. I'm looking into the future. And Lord, I'm not exactly sure what you have for a young man like me to do. But I do want you to know right now, I'll do whatsoever you want me to do. You died on the cross and paid for me. And I belong to you lock, stock, and barrel. And I want you to know if it will be, if it's made clear to me where I should go and what I should do, I will do it. If you want me to move away from Canada or from my house and go somewhere just to spread the gospel, I will do it. See, you know what you could do today about the Great Commission? You could be yielded to the Lord. Yes, you can. Or you could come to the Lord Jesus. Some of you know nothing about this. Church is church. I don't know what your impressions are of church. But actually, this church is about someone. And that someone is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who came to this earth to meet the needs and solve the problems and save the souls of mankind. And you need to be saved. And you know what? One of the biggest things to happen in the world today would be if you came to Jesus Christ. And that would be your part. It's something else since we've read this passage. Something else you can do is you can go to a prayer meeting. Now, I don't know if there are prayer meetings today, but I know they have mighty, wonderful prayer meetings at this church. And you know what you ought to do? You ought to attend some of them. And they know something about letting the Holy Ghost take charge of the prayer meeting. You need to be in a prayer meeting like that. So start going to prayer meetings. That's where God meets with his people. And it has an awful lot about launching the Great Commission and getting the love of Christ to the whole world. And then another thing, you've read those verses with me. Listen to the Holy Ghost. Listen to the Holy Ghost. I was with a group of men from an organization called RU, which is an organization of people who study how the Bible says Jesus Christ came to set us free. And if you know John chapter 8, if the Son will make you free, you shall be free indeed. He didn't come just to save us from hell. He came to save us from ourselves. He came to rescue us from our sins. That's right. And I was with a group of men trying to teach them how to have a prayer meeting. And how to have a prayer meeting led by the Holy Ghost. And we had a very good time of intimacy with God. We really did. But I heard one of the fellows afterwards, he said, Boy, that was great. We ought to do it that way every time. Steve Currington was the founder of RU, which is an organization to help people with their addictions. It's about recovery, okay? 
And he said, you know what Steve Currington used to say, and Currington now has gone to heaven. He used to say, before you pray, listen. Before you pray, listen. Let the Holy Spirit show you what you ought to ask. The Bible says the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh witness to us, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Meaning this, Carrington said, before you ask, listen. And friends, it's not going to be a voice. But if you're yielded and you are listening in this sense to the Holy Spirit, he will guide the prayer meeting and he will guide you. And I think that someone yielded to Jesus Christ without any reservation and coming to him and praying and saying, Dear Lord, show me my role. This is a mighty big project, taking the gospel of your love and salvation to the whole world. And I'm willing to do anything you want me to do. Show me what to do. Friend, a yielded Christian who will pray, and if you'll listen, the Holy Spirit will speak to you, and it'll be a key to success in your life. Let's all bow our heads. Can we bow our heads right now? Dear God, thank you very much for your plan for our life and that it's being fulfilled. Lord, I ask you that everyone who came to church will know God through Jesus Christ. Help them to see how simple it is and how important it is to come to Jesus and let him save us. Then, Lord, for every saved person, I pray that all that came to the meeting would yield to you and be, be willing to do whatever, whatever, whatever. And, Lord, that they will talk to you and have you talk to them about what you want them to do. And with our heads bowed, I know I'm not really in the room. If you're a person who came to church, Pemina Valley Baptist, this is a great place to meet God. And there are people in the room who are looking. I can't see you from this long distance, the state of Michigan. But if you would say to someone, if you'd be willing to let someone know, I'm a lost soul who needs to be saved. Well, then I'd like you to raise your hand right now. And uh, so somebody can see your hand and pray for you now and then meet with you after church to explain how to be saved. Would you do that? If you're a person who knows your need of Jesus, would you raise your hand right now? Then I have one more question. Others may have other things to say. Uh, who will say now, you know what? You talked about the Holy Spirit speaking to us. I think the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, Brother Flanders. Uh, I'm a Christian, but I think the Spirit who lives in me is speaking to me about something. And I want to be able to yield to him and tell him, yes, yes, Lord, whatever you want. If that's what you're saying, would you raise your hand? Hold it up right now, please. Someone will notice it. And then when we come to the end, when music is going to be played, I'm going to ask you to come forward and kneel down here somewhere in the front row or someplace. And if you can, would you pray with someone and open yourself up to them and, uh, and say, Lord, I think you're telling me this and I'm willing to do it. Would you do that? There'd be a great way for us to find God's will for our life and also a great way to help our church be the launching pad. Thanks for listening.